The future of Bristol is very uncertain for 2024. Kyle Larson and Ryan Priest have beef in the cup race at Bristol Dirt, and Kyle Larson says that NASCAR should not be racing on dirt. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got a ton of NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight in those really, really quickly. We're going to go ahead and start talking about the truck race at Bristol Dirt. As Bob Park is reported from Racing Insight that this is the first race since the Sage era has happened to have the same 1-2-3 finish in each Sage. Those three top finishers were Joe Logano, Ty Majeski, and William Byron, all in the same 1-2-3 positions. There was not a lot of rhythm in the truck series race, and that's why this ended up happening. There wasn't a lot of passing. It was very difficult to get some rhythm in the truck series race. So, which would have been a little more different, but that's the first time that that has happened. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Justin Owens as tragedy struck the motorsport community this past week. Justin Owens unfortunately suffered a really bad wreck in Lawrenceburg and unfortunately passed away in that crash. Really major tragedy, just really, really sad news. And my prayers and condolences do go out to Justin Owens' family. Just a really big tragedy and just an unfortunate story that unfortunately happened. So my prayers and condolences do go out to the Owens family at this time. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Busch. Now, we do have a couple Kyle Busch stories that we're going to talk about on the channel, but the first one is about Kyle Busch entering the media center with croissants. Kyle Busch has definitely become more of a character in this sport, and I absolutely love that he entered the media center like that. He said, ladies and gentlemen, the croissants are here. I really, really love that. That was really cool to see and happy to see that Kyle Busch enter the media center with the croissants. And that was really, really fun to see. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Busch once again. Now, there's a new Kyle Busch shirt that just came out from 3 Chai, and it's called the Kyle Kush shirt. This shirt looks absolutely incredible. I love that they're doing this. It looks phenomenal, and I definitely might have to get one of these Kyle Kush shirts because it looks phenomenal, and it looks incredible, and I absolutely love it. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Tony Stewart. Now, obviously, NASCAR is going to be doing the 75 greatest drivers list. Well, it was announced that Tony Stewart has become the first of the new 25 drivers that have been added to the 75 greatest drivers list. Absolutely well-deserved. They'll be fire-reeled every week. I think they're going to build one maybe later today, if I'm not mistaken. But it's really cool that they're adding Tony Stewart to it. Tony Stewart, of course, a 49-time winner in the NASCAR Cup Series and a three-time champion, also an owner champion in the series. Well, is there my opinion, and congratulations to Tony Stewart on getting added to the 75 greatest drivers list because he absolutely deserves it, in my opinion. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Tommy Ballin. As it was announced yesterday that Tommy Ballin has become the competition director of Rick Ware Racing. Ty Baldwin, a legendary crew chief and an owner of a NASCAR Cup Series team in the past as well. This is a really, really good pickup for Rick Ware Racing. I think that Ty Baldwin is really going to help Rick Ware Racing take the next step. That team's making some really big moves over the offseason. They've shown some pretty big improvements so far in 2023. So I do believe that Ty Baldwin could really, really help this team out and become pretty competitive teams. So happy for them that they got Ty Baldwin on the team. And I think he'll do a really good job helping this team improve going forward. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Abel Motorsports. As it was basically reported, I think, by Racer.com on, I believe, Friday, that Abel Motorsports is trying to field an Indy 500 entry potentially for R.C. Anderson. Now, Abel Motorsports, of course, is currently in Indy Lights, Indy XT, which is the new Indy XT series. And they are trying to find field an Indy, Indy, of course, <clears throat> Indy 500 entry for R.C. Anderson. R.C. Anderson has tried to make the Indy 500 many, many times. I believe has made it once or twice in the past. So it would be really cool to have another Indy 500 entry, and it would be really good for Bump Day to come back. So there's been a lot of concerns about Bump Day happening. There's always a last-minute entry that sometimes enters. And if this team does enter the Indy 500, that would mean we would have Bump Day in IndyCar once again for the Indy 500. So that would be really, really fun to see. I hope it ends up happening, and we'll see if it does end up coming true and happening. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Chad Fincham. As it was announced on Friday that Chad Fincham will drive for NBA Motorsports this upcoming weekend in, in Martinsville in the number 66 car. 
This will be Chad Finch's first start of the 2023 season. He did make a couple starts, I believe, for NBA Motorsports in 2022. So good to see that Chad Finch is getting back behind the wheel. Hopefully he can do a really good job this weekend with NBA Motorsports. And hopefully he can make the show because they've struggled to make the show this year. So hopefully Chad Finch can get this team in the field this weekend at Marsville. Hopefully it ends up happening. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Napa. Now, it was reported by Adam Stern on Friday that Napa says it's satisfied with the way Chase Elliott's injury situation has been handled. Of course, Chase Elliott, of course, sitting out at the moment due to a snowboarding injury that ended up taking place. We'll talk about Chase Elliott here a little bit later in this episode, but it's really good to see that Napa's kind of happy and satisfied with the situation. Well, they're probably not satisfied that Chase Elliott's not behind the wheel of a race car at the moment, but it's good to see that Napa's not mad at Chase Elliott or Hendrick Motorsports right now because it just shows that sponsors do appreciate what Chase Elliott is doing on the racetrack, and it's good to see that Napa's are not really unhappy with Chase Elliott at the moment right now, and they're satisfied, and they've handled it very, very well, and Chase Elliott's, of course, still recovered currently at the moment from his accident. Hopefully, he can continue to recover and get back on the wheel in the foreseeable future. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Milwaukee Mile. As it was reported by Adam Stern on Friday, or actually Thursday, evening, that IndyCar remains in talks with state and local leaders in Wisconsin and Milwaukee about possibly bringing a race back to the Milwaukee Mile per people familiar. This is not the first time we've heard this rumor. We heard this rumor last year that they're trying to get the Milwaukee Mile back on the IndyCar schedule. Obviously, the Milwaukee Mile hosts IndyCar races for many, many years. The last time they raced at IndyCar at the Milwaukee Mile was in the 2015 season. So it's been nearly a decade since the last time we raced on the Milwaukee Mile. I really hope they can find a way to get back on the Milwaukee Mile because I think IndyCar needs more oval racing. Oval racing, there's a lack of that currently at the moment. IndyCar, and I think that there shouldn't overflow the schedule, but I think more ovals on the IndyCar schedule is going to be a lot better. So I hope they can get the Milwaukee Mile back on the IndyCar schedule. I think it'd be really, really good for the sport overall, and hopefully the Milwaukee Mile is re addicts. I think it'd be really good for the sport if they can go ahead and bring it back on the schedule. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about NASCAR race day. As we, of course, had NASCAR race day revival return this upcoming week for this past weekend at Bristol Dirt, and it was very, very successful to the point where it had just been announced that the upcoming six races with SMI outside of North Wilkesboro, that NASCAR race day revival is coming back. They will be at the Atlanta, New Hampshire, the Coco 600, Bristol, Texas, and the Charlotte Roble. Now, they're obviously trying to get it on TV. They've not announced if it's going to be on TV at the moment. First thing is they absolutely need to have it on TV. I think it'd be really, really good for the sport because Race Day Revival was really, really successful, and it should be on TV. It should be on Fox, and I'd love to see Kenny Wallace and John Roberts back on TV. It would make Race Day so much better than what we have currently at the moment right now for Race Day on Fox. I think what we've seen on Race Day on Fox since Kenny Wallace and John Roberts have not been on there, I think it's been a major disappointment. And I think if they brought Race Day Revival back on TV, I think it'd be really, really good for the sport overall. So I really hope that ends up happening, and let's see if it does end up coming true, but I really believe and I hope it does end up happening where they can have it on TV, so I think it'd be really good for the sport. Hopefully, it does end up going on TV, because it should, in my opinion, go on TV. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Bobby Labonte. As it was announced during stage three of the cup race at Bristol Dirt that Bobby Labonte will join the Fox Sports booth for this upcoming race at Martinsville. This is a really good pickup, in my opinion, for the Fox booth. I really like the Bobby Labonte's getting into the Fox booth because Bobby Labonte did a really good job at Darlington for the throwback weekend. I thought he brought a lot of insight last year, and this is really kind of a little bit of a surprise, but also love the fact you're bringing him back in the booth because like I said, Bobby Labonte did a really, really good job and a strong job last year, and I think he will do a really good job once again this year like he did last year. So excited to see this for sure, and very happy to see that Bobby Labonte will be in the Fox booth at Martinsville. I think he'll do a really good job. Then next week after that at Talladega, Tony Stewart will be in the booth at Talladega. And then also, of course, Tony Stewart's already been announced to be in the booth for the Coke 600. We'll see who else gets into Fox Sports booth in the future. But I love that Bobby Labonte will be in the Fox Sports booth at Marzo because I think he did, will do a really good job in the booth. 
And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Chase Briscoe. Now, there's been a lot of talk about Chase Briscoe for a couple of reasons. We'll get into the other story around Chase Briscoe, Ryan Blaney later. But Chase Briscoe has been kind of wearing a little bit of a cast or basically a, something on his arm because he actually suffered a crash and I believe the Kyle Larson lay model challenge at Volunteer Speedway. There's a lot of talk about him potentially having surgery maybe later this week. It's not been announced. He's going to get x-rays later today and it will be announced later if he will get surgery or not. If he does end up getting surgery for his broken finger, it will be six weeks. Now, if he does end up getting surgery as well, he will not be out of the race car. He will still continue driving a race car, will not be out of it, which is good to see. At least Chase Briscoe did say he didn't feel terrible in the cop car. He says it's hard to get socks on, but he did say basically that it really didn't feel too bad in the truck. And he said it actually felt really, really fine. It wasn't a major issue, which is good to see. So, Overall, it's good. It sucks that he's basically got a little bit of a broken finger. Hopefully, the X-rays can come back. He doesn't have to have surgery, but there's a really good chance and a really strong possibility that he could end up having surgery. So we'll see what happens in regards to that. We'll see if Chase Briscoe does have to have surgery, but as of now, it's not been announced at this time. We'll have to wait and see what happens. And now we're going to hedge up onto the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Martin Truex Jr. Now, one of the big stories over the week was about Martin Truex Jr. and his communication with James Small and the frustration on the radio. Martin Truex Jr. spoke to the media this past week about that, and he says that all is all good between him and James Small. And on the radio, for what I can hear on the radio this past week in a breast start, the communication between James Small and Martin Truex Jr. seemed to be a lot better. Mark Truex Jr. said that they talked for about 30 or 40 minutes after the cup race at Richmond and talked about it in debrief. Again, we've seen Mark Truex Jr. have a lot of struggles so far in the 2023 season outside of winning at the LA Clash. It's been kind of a struggling year for Mark Truex Jr. with only two top 10s so far in the first eight races of the season. But it is really good to see that both Mark Truex Jr. and James Small are kind of starting to get on the same page once again because it really be good for the sport if both of them get on the same page. And I think that hopefully this means that they won't have any issues going forward. So happy to see that for sure. The Martin Truex Jr. is not mad at James Small because I knew that there was frustration between both of them. Hopefully there won't be more frustration going forward between the two of them and they can resolve their differences and continue to improve. Because honestly, if they do better, it will be great for the sports. So good to see there doesn't seem like major issues there. And happy to see that their communication seemed to be pretty good because their communication seemed to be very, very good in my honest opinion. And now we're going ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Kevin Harvick. As Kevin Harvick was speaking to media this past weekend about appeals, and Kevin Harvick says that all the appeals that have been going on should be live streamed on NASCAR.com. It says that he's not, he's not really surprised that Denny Hamill lost his appeal as well. I 100% agree with Kevin Harvick. I think all live streams 100% should be live streamed. All appeals should be live streamed on NASCAR.com. I've been saying this for the last week. I think the fact that appeals have not been live streamed on NASCAR.com really is a big issue with transparency because we've been talking about the issue with transparency of NASCAR, though they are going to be a lot more transparent going forward. But I think one way you can be a lot more transparent with NASCAR fans is if you live stream these appeals. I think even Jay McMurray said on race day yesterday that they should also live stream it as well. And I agree. Live streaming these appeals would be really, really good for the sport. It'd be really good for transparency. Fans can get a little bit insight on the appeal process. And I know the NASCARs will be a little more transparent now with these appeals. But I think another big way to get more transparent is live streaming these appeals. So I hope it does end up happening. I really hope it does because I think it'd be really fun to watch. And I'd definitely really tune into these appeals if they were live streaming NASCAR.com. I 100% agree with Harvick in a major way that they should 100%. Go ahead and do that because I think it'd be really, really good for the sport if they went ahead and did that. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about J.J. Yealy. Now, J.J. Yealy spoke to the media before the NASCAR Cup Series race at Bristol Dirt and spoke about Denny Hamlin. J.J. Yealy says that Denny Hamlin actually texted him. It also says that Denny Hamlin did apologize to him, but he also says that he expects a lot better from Denny Hamlin. Now, if you watch the NASCAR Cup Series race at Richmond last week, Denny Hamill just straight up dumped J.J. Yealy going into turn number one. Denny Hamill got squeezed by J.J. Yealy and I think another car on the outside. And Denny Hamill was very unhappy with J.J. Yealy. So going into the corner, Denny Hamill dumped J.J. Yealy in the corner. Now, Denny Hamill did, like I said, on his podcast, apologize to J.J. Yealy. He says he's going to text him and got back to him. And J.J. Yealy did say and reach, said to Denny Hamill, did go ahead and reach out to him. J.J. Lee also says, he, like I said, though, he expects a lot more from Denny Hamill, which I completely 
agreed. Denny Hamlin knows a lot better not to race like that, and Denny Hamlin especially was complaining about that a lot this past week. So it's good to see that there really isn't any more issues between both of them going forward. Hope their issues can be resolved going forward, and we won't see any more issues. But it's good to see that Denny Hamlin did reach out to J.J. Ely in regards to the situation, and I think it's good to see that he did go ahead and reach out. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Kyle Busch Motorsports. As Kyle Busch basically revealed in the media center on Saturday that Kyle Busch Motorsports will not appeal the penalties for the engine oil reservoir tank encasement violation. Kyle Busch Motorsports and Rev Racing over this past week, there were a lot of penalties that were announced over the last week or two and appeals and all that kind of stuff. And KBM was handed a 10-point penalty, and also Rev Racing was handed 10-point in point driver penalties and owner's point penalties for a violations of the oil reservoir tank. Not that really shocked Cobble said the penalty was going to be too much. Actually, the fine was going to be way too much to pay off and said that he was likely going to lose the appeal anyways, so that's why they're not going to appeal it. It's not a major shock and not a surprise either that he's not going to appeal it. I wouldn't appeal it, especially it's not really that big of a penalty anyways. I'm not surprised by that, not shocked about that, and again, like I said, not surprised that they are not going to appeal it. I think it's a good decision because they are probably going to lose the appeal anyways. And not surprised in the slightest that they are not going to appeal it. Not surprised by that in the slightest, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about William Byron. Now, William Byron was speaking to the NASCAR media this past week and at Bristol Dirt, and he is really not happy with NASCAR currently about in the moment and is really not happy about the penalty, talking especially about the R&D Center situation. Now, William Byron and Alex Bowman were both randomly selected, randomly, in air quotes, were selected by NASCAR to basically do a R&D inspection. And both Alex Bowman and William Byron were handed 60-point penalties for greenhouse violations and five-point uh, playoff penalties as well. Dropping Alex Bowman from the points lead down to seven for the Cup race at Bristol Dirt and dropping William Byron from about seventh or eighth in points down to 15th in the Cup Series points. And it really is, is unclear at this moment if Hendrick Motorsports is going to appeal those penalties or not at this particular moment right now. But I don't know if Hendrick will appeal those penalties. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't appeal it. But NASCAR did confirm this past week in speaking to the media that they said that basically, speaking to a lot of teams, that it's not random selections that they go through. So NASCAR can choose whoever they want. It's not really random anymore. They quit doing the random selections, and it's not random anymore. And it's disappointing to hear is I think it should be random. I, it makes NASCAR do, look a little petty. They went after Hendrick Motorsports, especially going after two of the Hender cars. And it's a little odd that they went after cars that finished 24th and 8th, not the cars that finished up front, because they used to go after the cars that finished up front. Now they went after the cars that were in the middle of the pack. It did look a little petty from he their point of view, but Hendrick could still end up winning if the appeal, if they end up deciding to go to appeal, they can decide to go ahead and appeal and they might decide to do that. So we'll see what happens going forward in regards to that, but I'm not surprised that William Byron was frustrated with NASCAR in that situation because it does look a little petty that they went after them and didn't go after anybody else in that situation. But I'm not surprised to see that, they, that he's frustrated by that. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ross Chastain and Christopher Bell. Now, if you watch the NASCAR Cup Series race at Richmond, Christopher Bell got in the back of William Byron, and he, speaking in the media, he actually blamed Ross Chastain for the incident. Now, Christopher Bell first spoke, and he says that there are no issues between him and Ross Chastain, and says he really doesn't have any problems with Ross Chastain, and says that he races Ross Chastain really respectfully and fine. Ross Chastain spoke to the media, really didn't say anything negative about Christopher Bell. He talked a lot more about the memes. The memes on Twitter over this past week especially were really, really fun. There were some really funny memes, definitely some kind of dark and questionable memes that kind of came out. But there were a lot of fun memes as well saying, thanks, Ross. And after the cop race at Bristol Dirt, some people are going to say, thanks, Ross, for bringing the final caution out. But I think at the end of the day, Chris Bell probably shouldn't have said that. Chris Bell probably at, would say that it really wasn't Ross Chastain's fault. But seeing some of the memes on Twitter over the last week, you got to admit, some of those were really, really funny and really, really hilarious to see. So I really enjoyed seeing a lot of the memes over the weekend, and I think Ross also enjoyed himself. Some of them he said he wasn't as big of a fan of, but I think a lot of the memes were definitely fun and hilarious to look at. So overall, in my opinion, I loved a lot of the memes, and I'm glad to see that Chris Bell and Ross Chastain really don't have any more beef between each other because if they did have beef, it would have been frustrating to see. And overall, happy to say there really wasn't any beef between both of them. Go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode 
as we're talking about Kyle Busch. Now, Kyle Busch was speaking to media yesterday, a law announcing the KBM will not appeal the penalties that they received. Kyle Busch also says that he's actually really surprised that Denny Hamlin actually lost his appeal. And he thought that Denny Hamlin was going to win his appeal. And Kyle Busch also says that where's the consistency and where's all the stuff, especially when Joe Logano admitted he got last year into William Byron last year, he's actually surprised that why wasn't there a penalty for Joe Logano, but why was there a penalty for Denny Hamlin? And he's surprised that Denny Hamlin lost his appeal. Now, we'll get into the appeal process, Denny Hamlin, just a little bit. But there's a lot of drivers who think, some drivers like Kevin Harvick, think they're not surprised that Denny Hamlin lost his appeal, especially after bragging on his podcast. But other drivers like Kyle Busch have said that Denny Hamlin probably should have gone and won his appeal. And I think there are, like even Mark Truex Jr. said a couple weeks ago, he's also surprised Denny Hamlin lost his appeal as well. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how drivers feel about it and stuff. And again, some drivers agree with the call. Some drivers do not agree with the call and wish there was a little more transparency as well. But I'm not surprised your Kyle Busch say this, especially with contact and stuff. It was intentional. What's not intentional? It's going to be very interesting to see what other drivers think throughout the upcoming weeks. And I think there are some people who definitely are surprised with the outcome of this situation. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Brad Keselowski and Denny Hamlin. Now, both people have spoken to the media on multiple different situations, and they spoke on the owners skipping the meetings. Brad Keselowski first said that Brad was not involved in the situations. He basically said there's a lot more going on that he's involved in than that, that doesn't really involve with the team meetings. He's not really involved in those owners' team meetings. He was not involved in the decision. Denny Hamill all said that there's more glaring issues that are going on that need to be talked about instead of exactly what they were going for those quarterly meetings. Those are quarterly meetings that end up happening, and he was one of the people that was involved with skipping the owners' meetings. Now, obviously, over the past week, we talked about this on the channel on Friday, but a lot of the team owners actually end up skipping the big owners' meeting in regards to different situations. And owners basically said they want Jim France and Lisa France Kennedy at the table to basically discuss the upcoming deal. Apparently, the owners have agreed to the upcoming revenue share deal, but one thing that's holding everything up is the charter deal. Obviously, Jim France does not want to make the charters permanent, and a lot of other people in the upper higher-ups in NASCAR, they don't want to make it uh, permanent, while you have a lot of the owner teams that do want to make it permanent because of how much money it is. Basically, charters have gone up to around $30 million at the moment, and that's the thing that's holding up this upcoming TV deal getting done. And they want to have the TV deal done by the end of this year, but before you can get the TV deal done, you've got to get everything done with the owners first before you do get the TV deal done. So I'm very intrigued to see how far this is going to go. I'm not surprised to hear Denny Hamlin brag about his comments in the situation. And overall, I'm not generally shocked or surprised by the comments there. Now we're going to head and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Denny Hamlin. As Denny Hamlin actually spoke on the changes around the situation in NASCAR's appeal process and all the transparency and all this stuff. And we'll talk about Denny Hamlin a little bit later in this episode, especially in talking about his appeal. As Denny Hamlin did say that the Detroit changes that they have made are actually really, really good and does wish that those changes did get made a little bit sooner and about transparency and all that kind of stuff. I do agree with Denny Hamlin here. I think it's good that they basically made some changes to the appeals process. It should have probably been changed, made changed before the beginning of this year, but I'm glad that it's now later than never. I wish it was made, like I said, later in the year, but I do agree with Denny Hamlin that some of the changes they've made, I think, are a lot more positive than negative. And again, I know a lot of people are really in disagreement about the changes, but I, like I said, I do agree with Denny Hamlin on that front in that aspect. So very intrigued to see how things go forward with the appeals process. Again, they're going to be more transparent. I think I agree with Kevin Harbick in the sense that they probably should go ahead and live stream those uh, appeals. I think it would be really cool if they did live stream those appeals. But overall, I really intrigued to see how things go on going forward with this in regards to this situation. But I do agree with Denny Hamlin with some of his comments here. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chase Elliott. Now, Obviously, one of the big stories around Chase Elliott is how he's currently out at the moment due to a snowboarding accident. After he suffered a snowboarding accident up in Vail, Colorado, up in his house that his father owns. And basically, he got suffered that, and he's been out for the last six weeks. And this could potentially be the week that Chase Elliott returns, but right now it's still a week-by-week basis. We've heard indications and rumors that Chase Elliott could return at any given time. It could be at Martinsville. It could maybe be later this year at Talladega. It could be at Dover. We're not entirely sure when he's going to return at this particular point. If you want my prediction, I still believe that Chase Lay will be out this week. I don't see Chase Lay 
returning to a cup car. And the reason I say I don't see Chase returning to cup car this week is because of how much bre they're breaking there's going to be a Mars on Mars on the track where you have to break a lot and you have to use your feet and legs a lot. And Chase Elliott probably hasn't been on his feet as much since the snowboarding accident. So I don't know if Chase Elliott will return this week. Now, could he return next week at Talladega? It's certainly possible. You won't have to break as much at Talladega. Yes, you could survive, get involved in a crash, but also Chase could start the race and then have like Josh Berry come in and finish the race for him. So maybe he returns next week at Talladega. That definitely could be a possibility for Chase Elliott going into next week. But as of right now, they have not officially announced when Chase Elliott is going to return. It could be this week at Martinsville. It could be next week at Talladega. It could be at Dover, but there's a lot of breaking in Dover too. So it's going to be a week-by-week basis, and hopefully Chase Elliott can return to the racetrack really, really soon. I don't think there's currently a set date when he's going to return, but I think it'll be in the next two weeks. I think it could, potentially could be next week at Talladega, but I don't see Chase Elliott returning at Martinsville. But I think it could be a Talladega, but we're going to have to wait and see what happens when Chase Lake does officially return to the Cup Series. Hopefully, he will return soon, though. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chase Briscoe and Ryan Blaney. Now, on the final race of our race around eight laps ago, there was contact between Chase Briscoe and Ryan Blaney going into turn number one. Chase Briscoe tried to go into a hole that really did not exist at the time, and Chase Briscoe unfortunately turned Ryan Blaney. And unlike certain incidents like the Michael Medall 360, which is really, really impressive, NASCAR did not throw the caution with eight laps to go, and it caused Ryan Blaney to go from having a shot at maybe winning the race to going to finishing outside the top 20, which is really disappointing. Now, Chase Briscoe, after the race, spoke to the media, and he took responsibility for the wreck, saying that that was my fault. That's the second year in a row that I have made a mistake at Bristol Dirt when I've been in contention for maybe winning, and I may just made another mistake. Yeah, because you have to remember, and you have to go back to last year, where near the end of the race, on the last lap, Chase Briscoe made a dive bomb move into Ch uh, Tyler Reddick, spinning Tyler Reddick out. Tyler Reddick was not really mad at Chase Briscoe for the incident because he said he would have done the same thing. But this is the second year in a row where Chase Briscoe has made a mistake at Bristol Dirt. And if you look over the last years, especially Chase Briscoe has made a lot of mistakes on the racetrack when he's been in contention for the win. Look back at the Coke 600 between him and Kyle Larson, where he tried to send it on Kyle Larson with two laps to go and spun himself out and created a restart where a lot of cars end up getting taken out of contention on the next restart, including Austin Dillon and Ross that seem to have been up front a lot of that race as well, who were also on fresh tires as well near the end of that race. I think Chase Briscoe is going to have to learn to be a little more careful going forward. And I, again, I do appreciate Chase Briscoe for making basically admitting he made the mistake because that clearly was Chase Briscoe's fault. I will say, though, I appreciate that from Chase Briscoe that he admits that it was his fault because, yeah, absolutely was his fault. And he also says that he expects payback, and I think a payback could be coming for him in the future. But we'll have to wait and see what happens if there's payback in regards to that in the foreseeable future. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Dale Jr. Now, NASCAR, of course, is returning to North Wilkesboro later this year. And Dale Jr. have been asked if he is going to return to the cup car at North Wilkesboro or truck in North Wilkesboro. And Dale Jr. basically confirmed that he is not planning to run the All-Star Race at this current moment. He says that basically his cup days are long gone. The last time a Dale Jr. raced in the NASCAR Cup Series car was back in 2017 and has not raced in NASCAR in general on a full-time basis since the 2017 season. Now, Jr. is going to run two Xfinity Series races this year. I think one of those is going to be Bristol, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember exactly which races he's announced that he's going to run, but he's going to run two races this year, one of them a Helmets, one with another company. I think Bass for Shops is going to be the other sponsor that Dale Jr. is going to run later this year. But Dale Jr. basically said that he's not really ever, not, has not completely ruled out a possibility of ever running a cup car again, but he says as and now he's not running the all-star race, but he does say his cup days are long gone. I would absolutely love for Dale Jr. one day, though, to come back and race in the cup series. I know he has said publicly he wants to be an owner in the Daytona 500, bring his team up to the cup series, and also wants to basically own a car that can run, run in the Indy 500 as well. I would love that. I really would love for that to end up happening. And overall, again, it does suck that Dale Jr. is not going to run the North Wilkesboro because I think it'd be really good for the sport if Dale Jr. did run in North Wilkesboro. I understand as of now why he doesn't want to run in North Wilkesboro, but I would love for him to maybe come back one day and race in a cup car once again. Again, he's not ever ruled out possibly of ever running again, but he says as of now his cup days are long gone. I think he should run another race in the cup series again, though, in the future. I Maybe not in North Wilkesboro, maybe somewhere else he decides to run. So 
We'll see what races. We'll see what ends up happening going forward. Is this one Dale Jr. is kind of ruled out running in NASCAR once again, at least in the Cup Series? But we're going to see Dale Jr. run a couple of Xfinity Series races going forward, which is going to be really fun this year. And of course, Dale Jr. is going to run the late model race at North Wilkesboro in the Sun Drop car that's going to be on his car for this year and next year as well. And overall, I think it'll be really fun to have Dale Jr. get involved in that. So we'll see what happens going forward. And maybe Dale Jr. does decide to run in the future. But as of now, he is not returning to the cup car as of now. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Denny Hamlin. Now, Denny Hamlin, of course, lost his appeal this past week. And Denny Hamlin had an emergency podcast and did emergency action detrimental podcast basically going through and talking about the appeals process. Now, Denny Hamlin did say in this podcast, and he says the appeals process is very, very fair. He says he presents his, presents his side, and then NASCAR presents their side. He says the appeals board actually was questioning NASCAR quite a bit, but after the decision was made, he actually was really shocked and surprised that he ended up losing the appeal, especially the fact that the appeals board was questioning NASCAR. He was really, really surprised that he lost his appeal. And he also said that they made a decision in 15 seconds and said, yeah, NASCAR, you win the appeal and the decision stands. And Denny Hamlin was really shocked and surprised and just surprised that they really didn't get a reason and explanation to why they went ahead and made the decision that they had made. And that's really frustrating as a fan to hear because, in my opinion, they got to be transparent. They should say why NASCAR won the appeal and not just sit there and make a decision there. Because that's been something, a big issue with the appeals panel. Now, NASCAR has made some changes in regards to those rules when it comes to the appeals. And some drivers have agreed with those changes. But also, again, I do agree with Denny Hamlin here. Why were they not transparent? Why could they not give at least a little bit of transparency? Because I think if you, they would have been a little more transparent, I think there wouldn't be an, as much frustration. Because, again, Denny Hamlin was baffled with the decision considering they said that they were agreeing with Denny Hamlin's side. And NASCAR was like, yeah, we were a little bit petty with Denny Hamlin's situation. Because if they were green, why did they basically keep the decision that NASCAR made? And NASCAR, like I said, won the appeal. And again, they should have at least uh, kind of talked about it, went more broad with the situation. And I think that's why a lot of people in the industry were really, really frustrated with appeals. And I think a lot of people are kind of tired of talking about appeals. When you have appeals becoming a major topic and not the racing product out on the racetrack, it can be definitely really, really frustrating as a fan. So, Overall, I think any uh, podcast, if you've not seen the podcast yet, I think I absolutely recommend you go and watch it. It's a really good podcast. It's a very enjoyable podcast. And I really do love the Action Detrimental podcast. Sometimes it could get frustrating to watch for sure. But overall, I really enjoyed the podcast. It was very enjoyable. And I think if you've not watched it, it is an absolute must watch. And I think you absolutely 100% have to go watch that podcast. Hopefully you guys go check that out. And Danny Hamill swings a lot more better. I would definitely recommend go and watch that podcast. There's a lot more stuff talked about in that. And now we're going ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Circuit of the Americas. As we got a lot of stuff talking about Bristol Dirt, but let's, let's talk about another SMI track, and that is Circuit of the Americas. Now, of course, SMI does not own Circuit Americas. They rent Circuit of the Americas. And it was reported by Bob Pockers and other reporters that Morgan Smith said that he anticipates SMI and Coda agreeing to have a race at Circuit Americas once again in 2024, as this, of course, is the contract year for Circuit Americas with SMI and staying at Circuit Americas racetrack. Obviously, I am 100% for keeping Coda on the racetrack. Coda is an absolutely great racetrack. It provides a lot of good racing. This was the best Coda race I've seen so far. Great racing, a lot of great field strategy. Yes, Turn 1 has been a major issue at Coda, but that's been kind of an issue for Formula 1 as well and other tracks when it comes to the racing product there. But when I go back and look at the situation, Coda coming back in the schedule, 100% well-deserved. It also brought, again, a very strong crowd. For people that said at the racetrack, the crowd looked really, really good. And in my honest opinion, I think that if you're going to want to keep, again, I think Coda, you got a younger group as well. One of the younger crowds you get because Austin is a growing city. And I think staying in that market is really, really big for the sport in general. And they need to continue staying in that market. So I think it's well deserved to come back to the schedule next year. Again, I don't know if we keep like six, seven road courses going forward, but I really did enjoy the racing at Coda, and it absolutely deserves to be on the schedule long term and going forward. So I'm happy to hear that they likely are bringing it back to the schedule next year. It's really good news to hear. It deserves to be on the schedule. It's brought a great crowd. In my opinion, I hope they sign a long term extension and Coda stays on the schedule for the next 10 to 15 years because I think the road course racing was really good at Coda this year. It provided some great, fantastic racing overall. I really enjoyed it. 
It was exciting. It was fun to watch. And I absolutely 100% hope Coda stays on the schedule long term. It sounds like it's going to be back in 2024, which is really, really exciting because, like I said, it absolutely 100% deserves to be on the schedule long term. I enjoyed it. It was very, very fun. It was exciting. And I'm really excited to hear that they are bringing it likely back on the schedule next year because they brought a great crowd, brought some great racing, brought a pretty solid finish between Tyler Reddick and Kyle Busch here for a little bit and just fun racing overall for fans. And it's a really good boom in city. And NASCAR should 100% say it's Circuit America's long term. And I'm glad to hear that they likely are going back there in the future because it deserves to be on the schedule long term, in my honest opinion. Now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are going to talk about Kyle Larson. Now, Kyle Larson over the years, it's no secret, has been a little bit outspoken about NASCAR racing on dirt. And once again, Kyle Larson once again was outspoken about saying NASCAR racing on dirt and says that the Cup Series in NASCAR in general should not be racing on dirt at all. This got a lot of talking points, and a lot of people were talking about this. He wasn't the only one that was kind of against NASCAR racing on dirt a little bit. I think Bubba Wallace was another driver that kind of said that the Bristol dirt race was a gimmick. Brad Zosky also was against dirt racing as well. But you also had other drivers like Chase Brisk and Austin Dillon who were definitely for NASCAR racing on dirt. And I want to get to the comments that Kyle Larson said. I have to disagree with Kyle Larson. Look, Kyle Larson is my favorite driver. Let's not be mistaken. He is definitely my favorite NASCAR Cup Series driver. But I do believe that NASCAR should be racing on dirt, and the Cup Series should be racing on dirt. Now, maybe not at Bristol Dirt. I think some people would be fine if NASCAR didn't race at Bristol Dirt. But I do believe that Kyle Larson is in. I disagree with Larson saying that NASCAR should not be racing on dirt. I think NASCAR 100% should be racing on dirt because it gives drivers the possibility, and it gives NASCAR a more diverse schedule. And in my opinion, if we had another dirt race or two, I think it would be a little more legitimate. I think the fact that it's one race, teams don't really focus on it. If you add more dirt races to the NASCAR Cup Series schedule, like maybe Eldor, maybe other dirt races like I-55 Raceway, which is my hometown track, I think you would have teams focusing on that a lot more, and it would be a little more legitimate. I understand Kyle Larson's sentiment, though, because Cup cars don't always produce as good racing. Of course, Kyle Larson isn't as good in dirt in the Cup Series as he is in other forms of racing when he does race in other forms of dirt racing, including the late bottle race that he ran. A Cup car is definitely going to race a lot different on a, a Bristol Dirt than, of course, other cars are going to run. But then again, Kyle Larson is also in disagreement with dirt racing in general in NASCAR. Again, he's a big fan of dirt racing, folks. He's one of the greatest dirt racers of all time. Has won a lot of World of Outlaws late model races. And also won a lot of late model races as well as other World of Outlaws races. But I don't completely agree with Kyle Larson's comments. I do respect them. And again, I think Larson, if he raced at Eldor, he probably enjoyed a lot more than racing at Bristol Dirt, which we're going to talk about Bristol Dirt here in the not so distance future. But I do believe disagree with Kyle Larson's comments just a little bit. But I understand why Kyle Larson is against racing on dirt. He says cup cars should not race on dirt. He said just in general, Kyle Larson just says that NASCAR shouldn't be racing on dirt right now. So I don't completely agree with Kyle Larson's comments there. But I have to respect his opinion in some shape or form. And now we're going ahead and jump on to the first of two major stories in today's episode as we are talking about Ryan Priest versus Kyle Larson. Now, this is the beef I did not expect in 2023, but you watched the NASCAR Cup Series race at Bristol Dirt, you saw the beef between both drivers. So, I believe this was in stage two, if I'm not mistaken. Both Kyle Larson and Ryan Priest are trapped a little bit farther back in the pack because you had four guys that stayed out, that being Tyler Reddick, Mark Trick Jr., Bubba Walls, and Ty Dillon. And Kyle Larson was trying to clear up in front of Ryan Priest. Well, Ryan Priest is there, and Kyle Larson unfortunately cleared up in front of Ryan Priest. And Larson unfortunately put Ryan Priest into the outside wall by clearing up in front of him. And after when that caution came out a few little bit later, after Ryan Priest spun out a little later, Ryan Priest was very unhappy on the radio. And Chad Johnson on the radio all said that Kyle Larson thinks he's the best. And Ryan Priest says he probably was going to pay back Kyle Larson in some shape or form. Well, the payback did come a little bit later in stage number three as Larson actually decided, team decided to make a really bad call where they decided to stay on older tires and did not put fresh tires on, on 75 lap tires. And Kyle Larson went to the bottom and ended up spinning out and dropping to the back. Larson was starting to make his way back toward the front. And then, of course, the contact happened where Ryan Priest paid Kyle Larson back, a little bit contact down the back stretch. Larson seemed maybe to get a little frustrated or something broke on the car. Hits the inside inside of Priest. Then basically goes to the outside wall. Gets a ton of damage. Unfortunately, Jonathan Downpour got collected in that same wreck as well. And payback ensued. After that, Kyle Larson spoke to Fox and kind of said that he should not have been back there in the first place. But also spoke to the media and said, 
I figure we could just grow the F up and grow ups, grown ups, and get the F over it. Basically saying that he, Ryan Priest, should have gotten over it. Now, Ryan Priest then spoke to the media after the race, after basically crossing the finish line in 21st, and Ryan Priest basically admitted that, didn't admit to, he basically said, after what he said on the radio, he said, I got loose. And a lot of people are going to say, well, Ryan, why did Ryan Priest not admit to basically intentionally wrecking Kyle Larson? Well, I think it's a no-brainer. He's not going to admit to it. And I think a lot of people look at what happened with Denny Hamlin. And I think the fact that Denny Hamill got in trouble and got a 25-point penalty for basically admitting on a podcast that he intentionally wrecked Ross Chastain or got into Ross Chastain, Ryan Priest is not going to admit that he ran into Kyle Larson. And a lot of you are going to say, why? what are your thoughts on as a Kyle Larson fan? Well, look, in the situation with Kyle Larson, I think Ryan Priest may have overreacted with the Kyle Larson situation because Ryan Priest did the same thing to Kyle Busch and Ty Dillon in the race. But you also have to understand that Ryan Priest this year has had a really frustrating year. And he was having his best race so far of the season since the Bushlight Clash. It had a car that easily could have won this race. And in the heat race, was definitely faster than Kyle Larson. But Ryan Priest has been driven really, really bad this year. He was frustrated at Coda, and at least he acted on what he was going to do. And I can't blame Ryan Priest for being frustrated. He's been having a frustrating 2023. And then a lot of people also were talking about Tony Stewart in the booth saying, why was Tony mad at Ryan Priest? Well, Look what happened. Danny Hamlin got a big penalty. So he said, I hope not. I hope that wasn't intentional because that could be a penalty coming for Ryan Priest. Do I think Ryan Priest should be penalized? No, absolutely not. We shouldn't penalize drivers for wrecking. Or well, maybe if they intentionally wreck him. But again, it maybe it was intentional. But I don't think that Ryan Priest should be penalized for the incident. But if you want my honest opinion, I also think maybe Ryan Priest a little overreacted a little bit in the situation. But then again, Ryan Priest has been driven with a lot lack of respect this year. And I can't blame Ryan Priest for being frustrated and upset. Now, both drivers did say they're not planning to talk to each other after that. They basically filled their case. So hopefully this beef can be done between both of them going forward. I don't know if Ryan Priest will be up front as much as Kyle Larson has been because <clears throat> Larson's team kind of cost him a shot anyways, and Larson should have never been back there to begin with. I have no clue. I don't know if it was Cliff's decision or Kevin Bender's decision to get him on old tires because that put him back there where that situation happened. And in my honest opinion, when it comes to the situation, Kyle Larson has had a history of making mistakes, driving a little over aggressive at times, and it's cost him a shot at a championship last year. And I think it might have cost him this year as well if he makes those mistakes going forward once again. So, <clears throat> in my honest opinion... I really don't know what's going to happen going forward in regards to that. And we'll see if there's any more beef between the two of them going forward. But I don't think there'll be any more beef. I think it's probably settled at this point. But then again, I've been wrong many, many times before. And we'll see what happens going forward. But I don't think there'll be any issues between them going forward. Because I don't know if Freeze will be up for contending as much. But then again, we'll see what happens going forward in regards to that. I think the beef might be done. I think Priest got his payback. And I don't think anything will come against us. Going forward, I don't know if they'll talk to each other. Again, they're saying they're not planning to talk to each other currently at the moment. Carson was pretty blunt after the race, so it was interesting to hear that he said that Ryan Priest should have definitely gotten over it. He was a little surprised that Ryan Priest was upset. It's basically an hour and a half after. And then Kyle Larson basically said that it was like, eh. He just kind of shrugged it off a little bit. Seemed a little frustrated, speaking to the media, and kind of just wanted to get out of there in that situation. It was like, said, do you believe there's anything in between there? He said, Nah, he just a little frustrated speaking to the media, but I can't blame Kyle Lawrence for being frustrated. He had a chance to win the race, and the team kind of cost him a shot and an opportunity at it. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about the future of Bristol Dirt. There is a little bit of uncertainty right now about the future of Bristol Dirt, and it came in a video that was surfaced on Friday and reported by Bob Pockers. Marcus Smith was speaking to media on Thursday after the announcement of the North Wilkes for All-Star Race format, and Marcus Smith said that there's no decisions that have been made about whether the spring Bristol Dirt Race will be on dirt next year for 2024. They said they have kind of looked at the schedule a little bit, but they have not announced that. Now, they say they're expected to be back in Circuit Americas, which they did go did kind of confirm they're expected to be back in Circuit Americas next year, 2024, but he also said that they're not confirmed if they're going to be back to the Bristol Dirt Race or not. I want to talk about this a little bit because I do have some things I do want to say about it. I've seen a lot of people being pretty negative about the Bristol Dirt Weekend overall. And it's, it's disappointing because I thought the race at Bristol was pretty good this year. I really enjoyed it. I think they did a really good job preparing the track. And I did enjoy it. If they are return to Bristol Dirt next year, I'd definitely be for Because I think that Bristol did provide a really good race. However, I'll be honest with you guys. I think there's a very strong chance and a possibility that there's not going to be a race at Bristol last year, this next year, because 
Bristol Dirt did not have a good crowd this year. I think the crowd honestly did look a little worse in 2023 than it did in 2022. And I think a big factor is racing on Easter. I think a lot of people think that NASCAR should not be racing on Easter, and probably some drivers think we should not probably be racing on Easter as well. But I also think it will go back to the crowd situation. There's been an issue with the spring race for many, many years, and I think a big reason why people are a little skeptical going to Bristol this year is because of the weather. The weather has affected the spring Bristol race for a very, very long time. And I think, in my opinion, we should move the race a little bit later in the year. If we're going to have Bristol in 2024, I do believe that we should move it to a little bit later in the year, to the May and June time. And here's why I say this, and I'll explain why. Looking back to the last 10 years, 2014, rain affected the weekend, race had a lot of rain delays. 2015, rain affected the race and the weekend in general, they had a lot of delays. 2016, they got lucky. 2017, spring race gets postponed. 2018, spring race gets postponed to Monday. 2019 did not get affected by rain, but I think there was rain in the vicinity in that area. 2020 got postponed because of COVID-19 and got moved to later in May. That's where it got moved to May, and that had no rain issues. 2021, race gets postponed to Monday, had rain issues in monsoons. 2022, there was rain throughout the weekend, and things I believe maybe gotten postponed, if I'm not mistaken. And 2023, we had basically practice qualifying get completely washed out, and it changed the complexion of the race. To me, if Bristol Dirt is going to stay around long-term and stay on a schedule long-term, in my opinion, you do need to move the race to a little bit later in the year. I personally think that they should move the race to, like I said, maybe late May, early June and move some race dates around because, in my opinion, if they're going to keep two Bristol dates around, that should happen. But I also think if they're going to return to Bristol, I wouldn't also mind them going to different dirt track as well. I think dirt track racing needs to stay on the NASCAR Cup Series schedule. If they decide to not run at Bristol, I can't blame them either because the crowd didn't look that great. Like I said, there's a lot of uncertainty about the Bristol dirt race going into 2024. I think there's a chance it's not going to come back next year. I just think some people feel like they probably shouldn't be a thing. Some drivers say we should come back to Bristol Dirt. But if I had to choose a dirt track, if we were not going to go to Bristol, where will we go next year? Eldora. I think NASCAR should repair their image and apologize to Tony Stewart. And basically, Tony's been in the broadcast a little bit. We know that Tony Stewart's been frustrated at NASCAR. And he might get out of NASCAR completely going forward. But I do believe that NASCAR should apologize to Tony Stewart. And they should try to repay the, pay him by giving him a cup race at Eldora. I think it would be a great crowd. I think it's a great facility. I think it'd be a great racetrack. There's other racetracks, like maybe Sharon Speedway, maybe other racetracks they could go with if they're going to run a dirt race. But I think dirt racing needs to stay on the NASCAR Cup schedule. I think you need that diversity on the Cup schedule going forward. But the question is going to be, will it be on Bristol Dirt? I'm not really sure. That's a big thing right now is the weather's been a big factor. If Bristol is going to stay next year, it needs to be later in the year. I don't think it should be on Easter going forward because, again, I think it will at Bristol. Here's a big thing you also have to remember, though, is that I think if Bristol loses their day, I think that you will see a loss of both Bristol dates. I think one date will stay around at Bristol because the only reason we have two dates at Bristol right now at the particular moment is because Bristol Dirt is around. Like I said, if Bristol loses his day, there will only be one Bristol race. And that will go to another racetrack, which, again, it should go to another dirt track. I think it should stay around next year. I personally think it should. But will it return next year? That's a big question and something to watch going forward. So we'll see what happens in regards to Bristol Dirt. I think it should stay around. It's a great facility. I enjoy the racing this year. But then again, I think fishing could have been better. But I also did enjoy the race this year. And it was a very enjoyable and fun race to watch. So, that is going to be for today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank guys for watching. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Notifications is on so you know if I win a video, it does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support my Patreon as well. Link description below with that, and comment with your thoughts below on today's video. Do you think Bristol should return next, or do you think NASCAR will not return to it in 2024? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about the Ryan Priest and Kyle Larson beef? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Tomorrow on the channel, we're going to have race picks on the channel. Actually, later today, we're going to have the Truck Series race picks for Barnesville. Then tomorrow on the channel, we're going to have the race picks for the Xfinity Series race. And we might also have another video around Junior Motorsports as well to talk about. Then on Wednesday, we're going to have race picks for the Cup race at Barnesville, along with the NASCAR news video. And then on Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to have silly season predictions on the channel for 2024. I think you're going to want to tune into that. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode. And I'll see you guys next time for some more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.